Hey, today is November 13th, 2017, and you're listening to Human Factors Cast, episode 66. That's appropriate for today's topic. I didn't even realize. Today on Human Factors Cast, we're talking about what robots, art, and learning to drive have in common with VR, taking a look at Ford's exoskeleton, and we'll be breaking down the controversy surrounding Star Wars Battlefront 2's pay-to-win system. You don't want to miss this, guys. Human Factors Cast starts right now. Welcome to Human Factors Cast, your weekly podcast for all things human factors, psychology, and design. Hey guys, welcome back to another episode of Human Factors Cast. I'm your host, Nick Rome, joined today by my good friend and yours, Mr. Blake Arnsdorf. Oh, what is going on, Nick? It's so good to be back. It is good to be back been a week and i already forgotten how to operate the soundboard it's all right man we finally figured it out after you know try number three it's all good it's all good it's all good blake how are you buddy how, what's been going on this last week for you man this last week you know it's only monday so it's pretty calm believe it or not but la- the entire last week was a little nuts there was like two or three big user experience events that i had going on and one was for world usability day in la and i gotta say like shout out to all the people that I work with at UXPA LA because we had some great speakers and workshops, but we worked really hard to put on just a sick event in LA. Uh, I was at a nice little, little intimate design studio called Philosophy, and I don't know, it was it was a lot of fun. Met a lot of interesting people, got to get a lot of social media con contacts for the organization, and we actually got a shout out from the international organization. So it's good stuff, and I hope soon that I'll be able to toss up some of the interviews we have with speakers as well as some of the uh, just general video we took at the event up on YouTube for everybody to check out. Oh, that'd be great. And if you maybe if you have anything that's super relevant to uh, any topics that we talk about on the show, maybe with permission, we can throw it up on the show as well. That would be cool. I think so. So, okay. Sure. So you've been doing a lot of the whole UX uh, circuit and uh, those events. Did you, did you post those in the Slack? Uh, I know that I posted one of them. I just can't remember which one it was. I want to say it was World Usability Day because that was a bigger one. I kind of, I also went to a local meetup here in San Diego hosted by UX Speakeasy, all about bringing kind of like user experience or human factors into the boardroom and kind of how you have to be prepared to interact with higher level professionals and convey, you know, the importance of upfront design and communicating with your user base and that kind of stuff. So that was super informative. Might not have posted that one. Well, speaking of Slack, uh, just shout out to our Slack community. Thanks for, you know, hanging in there and and, uh, and uh, contributing to all the great conversation going on over there. If you guys want to join us on our Slack, we uh, have the sh- link in our show notes, on our website, pretty much anywhere you can find us. You can get access to the Slack. Uh, it's a great place to connect with some of the uh, other previous hosts that we've had on the show. I know in the last week we had uh, Woodrow recently join up and... Um, you know, uh, the conversation's still going strong. So so please join us over there. Always happy to have new folks. Now, Blake, I I don't know if I told you, but I went to the Winchester Mystery House over the weekend. Oh, Nick, isn't that just the coolest? It really is, man. So, like, you've I'm assuming that you've done this tour before. Yes, indeed. Me and Elise went up there with our family. We even have a picture from it on the fridge. But yeah, what'd you think? Oh, man. So I was actually quite blown away. This this thing that is the house is at on the outside. Um, looks like, you know, the most crazy sort of architecture that you can think of. And uh, they, they kind of talked about the backstory um, behind Mrs. Winchester, who uh, inherited all this money from her, her husband, who was the... Uh, the guy who basically created all the Winchester rifles, so she had a lot of money, and uh, the story goes that you know all the all the people that these guns killed uh, are supposed to haunt haunt her, and she has to basically keep building on this house in order to uh, prevent the ghosts from um, from killing her. I guess I don't know, but but it was really interesting, and the thing that got me the most was that she was she had a keen eye for design, man. 
Yeah, she really did. And the the craziest part I remember about that house was it being so tailor made to fit her, her exact needs. Because I think as she got older, she had some serious ailments, and she was she was a pretty small lady. And this house is huge. I encourage anybody to look it up online. It is a gigantic house for one tiny woman. It is insane. And uh, yeah, so that's the part that I wanted to talk about. She had a keen eye for design. She actually created a couple different things that. Um, you know, we still use today like slants on um, on some of these uh, washing surfaces that just funnel the water back into the sink. Uh, slants on um, she was very smart about design. You know, slants on the on the roofs to make uh, to recycle water, and um, also she had uh, these stairs that were like an inch tall because she was very short. She couldn't lift her legs very high because of one of these things that you talked about. And, um, one of these, uh, diseases or, or ailments. And, uh, so, so she had these stairs that kind of wrapped around each other, but they were very, um, you know, they were like one step high. They, I think they call them easy risers or something, but it was, it was just a really fantastic, uh, experience to kind of walk through this house and go, uh, to, to appreciate the, um, the, the organized chaos that is the house. Yeah, that's the best way to put it, too, because she literally did, whether the folklore is completely true or not, I mean, she did just keep adding on to this huge house. Right. Uh, so it's it's just like, cre- and having to basically come up with her, I think her own designs for most of the stuff, or having to at least like elicit somebody and say like, hey, this is what I need specifically for my needs. Uh, but she was also like a massive entertainer, too. She has a like a few ballrooms throughout the house that are made for... Uh, made for entertaining guests and stuff like that. It was a it was an awesome experience yeah, when I went up there. You know what though? They actually said that she never had anybody over. She had these ballrooms, but never had anybody over. And that's another thing too. She actually made things really, really design friendly or or human centric, not only for herself but for her servants that she treated really nicely too. You know, they had um, sort of this this point in the middle of the house where um, her servants could access a lot of the wings of the house as kind of like the central pivot. And then she also had buttons where if she pressed a button and required assistance, her servants would be able to know what part of the house she is in. It was actually a really good, uh, very well thought out, as crazy as the chaos of the house looks like. It was a really well thought out thing. And and yeah, I do encourage any of our listeners who are uh, visiting San Jose or in the Bay Area to go check that thing out because it was it was an amazing experience. A serious feat in the design world. Well, Nick, what else is going on with you, man? Oh, man. So I hinted at it at the intro, but uh, have you been keeping up with this Battlefront 2 controversy? So, Nick, you know you were the one that introduced it to me before the show. Why I know. Why don't we it's... let our listeners in a little bit on what's going on? Sure. All right. So I'm making an audible here. We're going straight to it came from Reddit this week because this is something that's obviously near and dear to my heart, but it also affects us as practitioners in the field. And it's it's a weird sort of confluence of where my interests in, in both professional life and personal life meet. And so this is, this is a really good opportunity to talk about these things. So if you're not aware, Star Wars Battlefront 2 is a video game that is created by EA and DICE and Criteria and Motive that is coming out this week. And... There's been a lot of rumbling about the whole loot crate system, uh, whether or not, how, however you feel about it. There's been a lot of uh, point of contention around this thing, right? So people are calling this a pay-to-win system. People are saying that there's an unfair advantage to people with money, and uh, it does have an effect in multiplayer games, right? And the general rule of thumb, or at least you know, kind of what the community has established over the last couple of weeks or months, years even, I guess, it's... It's if the loot system gives you cosmetic items that don't affect your gameplay, it's fine if you pay for them. If the loot crate system gives you things that will give other players an unfair advantage, then it's considered pay to win. And the concept of pay to win has been around for a while. And uh, a lot of people are sort of criticizing EA for this. Now, why is this? It came from Reddit. Well, there was a player by the name of MBMM or MBM Maverick on Reddit this week who said seriously I paid $80 to have Vader locked. Now uh they paid for the deluxe edition of the game and and this whole controversy comes about because it 
based on some math that was done by another Reddit community member, uh, there it would take an average of about 40 hours to unlock some of these iconic characters like Luke Skywalker or Darth Vader. And people were like, that's a full-time job. And uh, so with that, the EA DICE community team came back with, get this, Blake, the most downvoted comment in Reddit history. Yeah, it's, uh, it's not looking good. What are the numbers for downvotes look like? Uh, at the time of this recording, which is Monday night, so Monday, November 13th, around 5.21 p.m., we're looking at 524,000 downvotes, over half a million. Woo! Oh, sorry, 500, 532. In like the 10 minutes that we started recording, we got another, you know. Another 10K. Yeah. So, oh, my goodness. So it is quickly. It, yeah, it's a it's a big point of contention. I wanted to bring this up because, well, let me read their response here. The intent is to provide players with a sense of pride and accomplishment for unlocking different heroes. As for cost, we've selected initial values based upon data from the open beta and other adjustments made to the milestone rewards before launch. Among other things, we're looking at average per player credit earn rates on a daily basis and we'll be making constant adjustments to ensure that players have challenges that are compelling, rewarding, and of course, attainable via gameplay. We appreciate the candid feedback and the passion the community has put forth around the current topics here on Reddit, our forums, and across numerous social media outlets. Our team will continue to make changes and monitor community feedback and update everyone as soon and as often as we can. Okay, Blake. There is so much to unpack here, and this is why I wanted to put it first, was because this is like, at least it's near and dear to me, but it's it's also a really good point of discussion. And I wanted to get your thoughts on the whole pay-to-win thing and also the community reaction to this this sort of uh, response. Yeah, so we'll we'll kind of break down pieces of it as we go, but... For the pay for the pay to win stuff, I don't know. It's it's a tough one because I just don't do it. Like I I'm definitely the guy that pre orders stuff before, when it's coming out for like extra in game features like this, like this particular Battlefront two did release. And I mean I buy DLC if I think it's worth it and stuff like that. But I really don't spend any in game cash that I can't make playing the game because I uh, I'm a big Call of Duty player. A lot of the stuff that I've gotten in like in game from loot boxes is all coming from just earning the in game currency through playing matches or playing zombies. So I really don't buy into it. I don't know if it's better or worse. I mean, there's plenty of times I've gotten mad by running against somebody with like stuff that's just way overpowered and they obviously like paid a lot of money to be able to hopefully get that lucky gamble from a loot box. Um, but I don't let it bother me too much. Uh, so in terms of the pay to pay to win thing, you know, I play pretty competitive in multiplayer and I've really, I mean, there's times that I rage out about it, but it doesn't ever affect me so much that I feel like I can't compete. So I don't feel like it's a, it's a big problem. Uh, I know a lot of people have a hard time with the play, play to win problem, but that's kind of like you alluded to earlier. That's the state of video games at the moment. So it's, it's kind of hard to change, uh, change the rules i mean you got to know what the rules are and you play within them and try and get your way around them um as far as the the insane backlash against this this particular comment from ea so i'm gonna go two ways on this first i think that they kind of open their themselves up to this uh, a little bit just because of how they gave a very stock response and if you read between the lines a little bit there's some uh i don't know i don't know how it, this is a lot of speculation for me, right? So for open betas, I often will play them a lot more often because I know that it has a short amount of time span that it'll be open for people to play and all that kind of stuff. And it's and you usually get like early achievements or early in-game gear, yada yada. But so if they're basing all of their pricing based off of open beta data, I'm not sure that that's an accurate way to go about it because right. people are probably going to play it a lot more. Um, so that's that's kind of a hole in their logic there. But Nick, can you tell everybody a little bit about what you got, what you would get for Battlefront 2 if you paid this like 80 bucks? Sure. So, well, if you get the base game, you basically get... The, the, the whole issue that people are having is that they've locked the heroes behind these paywalls or play walls, I guess, is is more the issue. Um, basically, if you if you buy the base game, 
you get the base game. You don't get any access to the heroes. You have to, uh, or, or maybe you get access to just a few heroes. I'm not quite sure. The game comes out for me in a couple hours here, so I'll be able to report back next week. And I will be streaming this week, so you can hear me talk about this all week. Uh, it'll be Nick R124 on either Twitch or YouTube. I'll kind of switch platforms, but um, so be on the lookout for that if you're interested and want to follow this whole thing. But I will say, uh, you know, if you pay the extra twenty dollars at launch, which is something that I did, is you get like heroes from the upcoming Last Jedi movie and a couple other perks that, you know, kind of give you a head start. Nothing too serious. And one thing that I want to say here is that it's not it, like half of it's the pay to win thing. And for me, that's not the big deal, right? Other games do this and it's not, you can't get, it's not like they give you access to anything that's not included in the game. Um, and other games have done this where they lock things behind a progression wall. Um, you know, where you play to unlock things in the game. Like, you don't get access in GTA to all the cheat modes right off the bat, or maybe you do, I don't know, but you don't get access to the entire map right off the bat. You have to play to unlock it. And to me, it's very similar. And I understand that a lot of people are upset about it because the arcade style of this, you should be able to just pick it up and play anything you want. But there has to be some sort of design that encourages the player to keep coming back. And that's where I'm conflicted because I agree with that. I agree that you want to sort of design the system to ensure that your player base comes back and engages frequently and supports you. Like, So this is a DLC-free game. There is no... You, you don't pay for any DLC that comes out with this game going forward. They are not going to fracture the player base by introducing maps that only a certain set subset of players have access to and others don't. This is going to be everything is available to everyone. And this whole buying loot crates is one way to support that. And so it's 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 interesting to me. How do you sort of get to this middle ground of design like where... Like oh my gosh. Okay. okay. Yep. Too busy with <laughs> stupid things going on if you have if you have uh a i lost my thought train of thought there if you have a progression system you want to make it very easily obtainable to users but you don't want to make it so easy that they blow through the content and don't keep playing so i don't know it's a very interesting place for me at least um i mean i took a week off of work to play this thing so it's like I, it doesn't bother me because I made time for it, but I can see where you know somebody who's like a stay at or who's a who's a dad or something that has um, or a mom. Let's not be sexist here. Who has you know other responsibilities that they have to take care of in life and don't have a lot of time to com commit to this game. You know, like it's I don't know. It's a, it's an interesting balance, and I think they. I don't know. I I am. I will say. I think. I, I am entirely embarrassed for the community's response to this thing. This is really embarrassing. These developers have been getting death threats because of a game. And like I am I am very ashamed of other Star Wars fans right now. This is not something you don't do this. That's not okay. Well, especially too when EA and in this particular franchise Battlefront 2 is trying something completely unheard of in the like massive multiplayer gaming space, right? Where they're not charging you like whatever it is, the 15 to 20 bucks for each DLC that comes out through the year. Like this is going to be free. So having that loot system, that makes total sense to me. I mean, they've got to make some ROI off of this and they're trying an entire different method. And something you would, we had talked about previously is, I mean, part of paying the $80, you did unlock like early access to the game. Some, amount of loot crates if that's right and then you actually unlock two additional characters right yeah yeah that's a fairly accurate i like it's it's two heroes that you didn't have access to that you would have had access to if you played enough and then other stuff that you can have access to it's nothing that you can't get in the game it's just paying twenty dollars to get it up front rather than um having to earn it yeah, and here's the th here's the part that I guess I'm frustrated with the community about. Maybe I just don't understand um, from their point of view, but it's like uh, I've got plenty of work things that I have to do, and I can't play, you know, like Call of Duty Zombies as much as I'd like to, and so it takes me longer to beat the Easter eggs. But I don't get mad at the development team because things are locked or hard to do, and that's like that's kind of like the fun of playing the game from my perspective. And I would feel like that 
even though their stock response is kind of cheesy, I mean, having that intent to provide players with a sense of pride and accomplishment for unlocking different heroes, like if you paid the 80 bucks, they gave you two heroes for your extra $20. And I don't know, are you not, are you just like not going to spend the time playing the game? Cause I, I don't know, Nick, I'm not sure about our audience base, but I've played a lot of games in my day and I've definitely spent over like 40 hours over a period of time oh, yeah. to unlock achievements. So it's, I, I'm not quite getting why the response is so huge and so massively negative about this aspect that you have to work to get a character unlocked. I think it's, I think it comes down to the iconicness of them. Um, and the fact that they are so difficult to get, like I said, it's about a 40 hour grind if you want to unlock this player. And People are criticizing also... So this is like a perfect confluence of a lot of things, right? So this is this is the fact that you don't get rewarded for performance. You get rewarded for playing. Uh, so if you complete a match, you, who has got the top score, get the same amount of credits that somebody at the lower end who went 1 in 30, killed a death ratio. You get the same amount of credits that they do. And so it doesn't matter how... Um, how well you do it matters how quickly the match ends and so that's kind of where it could be um another thing but i I just i i want to point out something in this statement here that at least to me is is something that's like what the hell what like okay so they say um We'll be making constant adjustments to ensure that players have challenges that are compelling, rewarding, and, of course, attainable via gameplay. They are listening to feedback, and they are going to try to fix things. Like, I don't understand why, like, yeah, sure, it's a big corporation, and they've messed up other games before with, you know, some of their advertising practices, sure. But the fact, like, the development team, it's not the development team's fault. It's the company's fault, obviously, for trying to... I don't know. It, it it just seems to me that the development team is on the player side and they want to create a game that's fun to play and they don't want to, you know, lock anybody out from... Th- they want to basically refine it to make it fair. And I think that goes overlooked. But I this whole thing is just a complete interesting use case about how do we design for a system that's not necessarily uh, a tool, but it is designed to have fun. So you got to really get that balance of the progression of uh, how do you sort of feel like you're progressing without locking out uh, or, or without it being a grind. You want it to give the players the pride and accomplishment, but you don't want to give it to them too easy to where it's like everyone's playing the same. I don't know. It's, it's a really interesting conversation. Yeah. And it's a tough one to have because I mean, like this particular franchise game, they're trying to do something completely different with the DLC. So that's like massive effort on their part. So trying to balance things and figure out like, okay, what, what's going to be a meaningful progression here for people by a gameplay is gotta be really tough. And to like, put all this work into development and then have it kind of get thrown back at you really hard. It's got to be tough. Uh, but you're right. You have to strike a balance, I think, between, you know, how hard is it? What's going to keep people coming back for more and stay engaged? But also, how are you going to make sure you actually make money for the time it took to produce this game? And I, I think that's really the problem that's that maybe EA is facing in some degrees with trying to release a bunch of DLC. Uh, but also, too, and you you gave me a little bit more insight by talking about maybe the the credit system maybe because there sounds like there's some flaws there but i would really like to know what the like what the big deal here is because again like i'm stuck on the fact that this is why you hardcore gamers in my opinion from my perspective play games like to unlock stuff to to beat your friends or whatever and to lo- unlock achievements and for it all to be given to you right away i feel like that would be bad design yeah, I agree. I, yeah, if there's no challenge, then it's not fun. But too much of a challenge is not fun. I don't know. I feel like we spent enough time on this, though. And uh, like I said, if anyone wants to see me stream this thing this week, uh, I will definitely be paying to win. So that'll be fun. <laughs> yes! Because I, I don't know. I'm kind of on the developer's side with this one. I, Like I said, I'm completely embarrassed about the community. Yes, there are some things that they can refine, but it sounds like, you know, it. it it sounds like they're going to do that. And um, 
people are just jumping on this whole, it's a corporation train and they're just trying to make money, which they are. But I mean, at the same time, I, you know, I know people in the gaming industry and they just want to create something that's, that they'll have fun with, but also that their friends and family will have fun with as well. So it's not like, it's not like they are doing this intentionally. Anyway, uh, are you ready to get into this week's news? Because I know we have some listeners that are like, get into the news. Stop talking about video games for God's sake. Yeah, let's do it. Stop talking about Star Wars, nerd. All right. This is, <laughs> this is part of the show all about Human Factors news. This is where we talk about everything related to the field of Human Factors. This could be medical, transportation, psychology, virtual reality, whatever it is. As long as it's Human Factors related, it's fair game. Blake, what do we got up first this week? Oh, man, we are going so deep on some AI on this first story. I, I'm super excited about this startup. Okay, so depending on who you ask, robots physically grasping an object, not dropping it, and then doing something useful with it is a thing that robots have been comfortable with for a while. The difficult part, though, is deciding what to grasp and how to grasp it, and that can be very hard for a robot, especially in an unstructured environment. Well, researchers like Pieter Abiel at UC Berkeley have been developing ways of teaching robots new skills rather than just actions and how to learn rather than just obey commands. In fact, there's a new startup called Embody Intelligence that is working on enabling industrial robot arms to perceive and act like humans instead of just strictly strictly following pre-programmed trajectories. Now, that last sentence alone is a quote from Embodied Intelligence. And that alone is just mind blowing to me. Yeah, so they're basically using AI to make these robots more human like in their uh, commands, right? Yes, exactly. Yeah. So basically, what it seems like they're doing, and there's a pretty cool video about or with one of the industrial robot arms tying a knot based off of information it gets. But the interesting intersection here of technology is that they're using vr as in a in combination with ai to teach these robot skills so yeah so they are basically strapping themselves in the vr they're using use cases to teach the robot how to do certain tasks and then the robot then learns from these inputs and finds the best way to do it yeah exactly and i didn't even think about the I don't know, because now that I've read the article, there's obvious benefits of using VR for this. But I, but we talk a lot about some of the problems with AI, or we've talked specifically about how chatbots can quickly, when they get access to the wrong kind of data, return prejudices and whatnot. But VR is really a great way to collect high-quality data that you can now feed to your AI, which will fuel your robot's like actions that it takes. So I just thought this was a really... Awesome and interesting use of VR just to capture more um, more high quality data to actually feed the robots AI. Yeah, so the video outlines sort of the uh, the researcher taking the robot's hand, so to speak, and putting it on a certain uh, place on this this string, and taking basically mapping the steps to take in order to tie a knot, and then the robot then analyzes the string after they've untied it and put it out to where um, the robot then learns to do it itself. And uh, it's, it's an interesting thing. I, so I, I will say Blake, I'm a little blown away that they are using humans as a, uh, as an example for this, because I feel that um, robots doing things the way humans do things is wildly inefficient. And I'm curious as to your thoughts on that, because we as humans are poorly designed. We're very poorly designed, and everything that we've created fits us as humans. Now, you would think that robots have the capacity to do things much more efficiently um, in, a, in a way that's, that's uh, you know, maybe potentially not something that humans can do. I'm curious about the possible applications for this. Why would you want to do something that is that requires a human form or I guess, why would you want to do something, why would you want to teach robots the way we do it when there's a much more efficient way to do it? Yeah, and you know, Nick, you bring up a great point, and there's two kind of problems I have with, I guess, have using humans as the you know teaching aid in this case. So when we're, just in this specific example, because this is localized to industrial robot arms, and we're talking about a human that is 
in a completely different form, has two arms, is able to move in different angles angles of attack that you know a, a robot arm might not be able to possibly do. So it, it does seem very strange to be using how we do it to be the analogous way that a robot should do it. Because even the article does mention that although the robots learn this very quickly based off of human instruction or human like basically like show and tell, they don't become very fast or efficient at it. So I think that really speaks to what you're talking about here, Nick, the fact that we're trying to teach, in this case, a one-armed robot, but a robot in general to do something that we potentially have a have become efficient at in terms of just doing it over time, but it's, it may not even be efficient for us with our, like our body structure at the moment. And the other kind of like second point here is, is I feel like now, since you're having to deal with a human that's got different kinds of limbs, you're now translating all of that information that's being seen in VR to the robot into something that's now analogous for the robot to use so trying to consolidate down okay you did these steps with the right and the left i only have a single arm i've got to figure out in the in an in algorithm how to combine the steps you did into one so it seems like computing power is now increased too plus it's not efficient oh, it has two arms well scratch that then <laughs> I'm just yeah it's it's really uh it's really fascinating to watch this robot do some of these tasks like it's putting together a plane it's doing um uh movement tasks where it's picking an object up and dropping it in a cup and then putting pushing the cup over like there there's a couple really interesting things I just am struggling to find the application of aside from you know tasks that require a human form which I'm struggling to think of really anything that a robot can't do better and i'm sure some of our listeners will jump in the slack and say hey what about this task and i'll i'll look like an idiot but i mean it'll be interesting to see you know what's what's going on with that i i yeah i'm a little uh little unimpressed but it's something still that there's there's probably a use out there we're just not we're just not in that domain and can't see it well, so here I think is the beauty of it, and that's like the the bringing VR into getting more high quality data for oh, sure. a, AI's algorithm. I think that's that's really the the bigger piece here. Because again, I think you're right, and why I think this is a problem that a lot of companies are having trying to get past using the human as the model for robots. Um, because why does it need to have two arms or why does it need to have arms that are just like ours? Is there not like a better design or is there something we could design in terms of like more efficiency? Um, I think we get really stuck in trying to emulate the human form into a robot. Yeah. Yeah, I agree. I think robots can do things so much more efficiently than humans and, uh, there's no need to, other than, no, I can think of a few applications, but I won't repeat them here. All right, why don't, why don't you say we get into uh, <laughs> another story here about Ford? Let's do it, man. Okay. All right, so speaking of people needing assistance from robots, potentially, so Built Tough has been Ford's slogan for years, but workers who assemble their trucks in manufacturing plants are always subject to human frailties. They can suffer from back and social Soldier, soldier, shoulder pain as a result Nailed of carrying it. out repetitive tasks required by their jobs. In fact, Ford estimates that some assembly workers lift their arms about 4,600 times per day or about a million times a year. That's a lot of lifting. So workers on Ford's assembly lines in two U.S. factories are getting some extra help in a pilot project. The workers are suiting up with EscoVest, an upper body exoskeleton. So here is another chance for us to, you know, enhance, I don't know, the human form using an exoskeleton. But this this one always gets me too. Like it seems like in plants like this be a great application for trying to put robots in and have some more advanced AI. But anyhow, Nick, what do you think of this one? I think uh exoskeletons are the short term solution to robot long term solutions. Uh exoskeletons can help us sort of uh, do these tasks that humans were not necessarily built to do. I think there's always going to be a need for some sort of um, human assistance when it comes to these types of things. And I'm excited to see that Ford is trying this stuff out in their factories, right? I think um, if you guys have any questions regarding ergonomics and, and exoskeletons, Woodrow, a good friend of the show who uh, has been on a couple times, if you're a longtime listener, he's actually in our Slack now. So feel free to ping him about any uh 
any of these questions you may have about um, the ergonomics side of things. But I am excited to see that they are they are keeping their workforce central in sort of how to um, improve their their quality of life as well. Most definitely, and I think I always like these stories about Ford because it keeps. Every every little one keeps showing a little bit of their kind of design process. And they worked, I guess, with uh, Esco Vest to make this uh, prototype for this particular pilot test project. And it looks like this the founder of Esco Vest themselves says that it evolved to the form that it's actually in based on just testing and running it in different Ford factories, seeing how it worked. Uh, but the other part of this that kind of blew me away, and I, it, I'd, I'll have to like, ping Woodrow about how exoskeletons like this might work, but this upper body vest basically has no, it's unpowered, and it doesn't have any robotics or anything like that in it that are predicting user movements. It's basically just helping relieve load that they're carrying, or putting above their heads. Yeah, so it looks like it's a redistribution of load, and um, I think um, we've seen exoskeletons that still help lifting, where they have sort of a flexible back, right? And nothing was mechanical there, or it was all mechanical. It wasn't, um, there was no robotics involved with that as well. It was just mechanical where you build up that potential energy and then um, release it when you get up, right? So I, I'd imagine this is just a redistribution of um, of sort of, energy so where you know they are working overhead so keeping your arms above your head is typically harder to do but if you had some support then you wouldn't have to use your muscles to uh keep your hands over your head and i think potentially um it could detect when it's above that angle and then start to engage something but then release once the human comes down after a certain point i'm not quite sure how these ones work but it is definitely interesting to see um, that especially that this this company Exo um, actually worked with Ford to develop this thing that was very specific to their needs. Yeah, which is probably part of the the best part about this particular like product. It seems because I mean, I feel like you could mass produce kind of exoskeletons, but if you're actually in the factory doing the upfront work to understand where it's going to be used, I feel like you you get a lot better sense of the real needs of it or can it and it can also of course inform the design um of the system itself but it'll be interesting to see how the pilot project goes or if we hear any kind of follow-up for this and if it gets implemented across different u.s plants or even across the world uh, but it still blows my mind that there's no like robotics in it like it i understand the mechanics of how it works um but at this point in time i'm just surprised we haven't seen one that's more kind of like they say predicting user movements and trying to maybe even find more Assist. efficient ways to move yeah yeah i am excited about this and uh definitely bodes well, bodes well for the future of human uh integration into these these factory floors um why don't we say we can get into virtual driving instructors let's do it man this one's kind of kind of a cool concept it reminds me of something in grad school but anyway, so Chinese driving schools are experimenting, experiencing a high demand as the number of learner drivers is constantly increasing. So a new type of driving simulator based that's based on a car that's been modified for virtual training of learner drivers with automated feedback is actually helping to close the gap for this demand. So for the close to reality driving experiences, the technology uses complex projection technology along with virtual reality hardware and some software. So the simulator was developed within the driving simulator or drive sim tech and it's part of a project that Kit and the Chinese partners are working towards to make it so more people can learn to drive. This man, Nick, I feel like this would have been a lot better if things like this had been implemented in driving school for me when I was getting my learner's permit or trying to drive. Yeah, yeah. So basically high level here is that they are putting people in VR uh, or, or virtual environments to help people learn to drive. So that way you're in a simulated environment and um, you don't have to worry about all the uh, sort of real world risks associated with um, putting learning drivers behind the wheel. 
Yeah, most definitely. And I, I've been in kind of driving simulators before that are very, I mean, as far as being in the actual context, like you're sitting in a, in a car that's been repurposed for this, but you're looking at like a very blank screen on the wall and it's like super choppy looking, um, mm. you know, choppy looking roads and it doesn't look very well. But I feel like the incorporation of VR into this system really gives people a chance to feel like they're getting experience on the road or maybe and it would be interesting to see hint hint to anybody potentially in grad school looking for something to do with driving in VR. What if you're if their like proficiency improves with driving using this kind of method? Yeah, so I'm trying to picture this. There's no illustrations on the website, but there is a YouTube article or YouTube video. So I'm <clears throat> looking at this now. But basically, I'm imagining that you're in a car with a VR headset on, and you're able to sort of um, interact with the car. Everything in the virtual environment is mapped to the car and anything that you do, then the virtual environment responds to those inputs. Is that kind of what I'm understanding here? That's what I'm getting so far. I mean, it's got a little bit of extra kind of bells and whistles in the driving simulator. So when it it's, of course, an actual car that's been repurposed. And so they do use some, right. <laughs> excuse me, some like air pressurized systems to to you know wow. give you better force feedback but yeah i mean as far as what's going on uh, visually you're spot on so this is actually really interesting so i'm looking at the video here and they actually don't even use a head mounted display they use uh, 3d glasses that are, have mappings to them so um so basically anything that you look at the environment responds appropriately with um you know the head movements and whatnot but you're just looking at a 3d screen it's a cave display uh, so they're using virtual reality in, in the sense of a cave display to um, uh, sort of help with learning, which makes more sense to me because you want to be able to interact with the physical car and not necessarily a virtual car. This is this is pretty cool. Yeah, most definitely. And uh, it's interesting, too, because like towards the end of the article, they bring up that basically what they do is they have learners go through these different driving simulators and it's actually built in that you have to have like so many simulation hours in order to like take your final driving test. But also the data that they're collecting on every time you're driving in the sim is actually given to an instructor who can try and like help you improve and all that kind of stuff. So it, it's skirting the fact that they don't have enough humans to put on this, but they're like still getting, getting you good feedback, whether it's from the actual car or from uh, an actual instructor. Yeah, some of the next steps could be potentially applying AI to sort of this data set that comes out from the learner's test drive and then uh, applying, you know, that that's whole sort of customized feedback approach through AI. So that way you don't even need instructors anymore. I could see that. And then maybe even tailoring what you know, simulations you drive in that day yeah. based on your performance. Yeah, I like it. I like it. All it's right. coming. All right. I just want to thank all of our friends over at Science Daily, IEEE Spectrum, Gizmodo, and New Scientists for all of our stories this week. If you guys want to follow along, you can join us on our Slack. We post some exclusive ones there. Uh, started doing that. We'll see how that takes. Um, but we also post most of them all over social media. So be sure to follow us all over there for links to the original articles as we find them. Uh, Blake, what do we got up next? Okay, so this is an interesting conundrum, Nick, and I think we're going to have a fun time talking about it. So Sean Parker, who we most most of us know as the visionary who co-founded Napster and also served as Facebook's first president, seems to have a few regrets about building the social platform that's taken over our world as we know it, telling an audience this week at an access conference that he doesn't know that if he, if he really understood the consequences of what he was saying because of the ended in unintended consequences of a network that grows to a billion or two billion people and it literally changes your relationship with society and even each other. He went on to say that Facebook itself probably interferes with productivity in strange ways and God only knows what it's doing to our children's brains. So Nick, I know we have a pretty heavy load here, but this is basically talking about where is that line between trying to get people to interact with your product or making them addicted to your product is really what I'm kind of getting from his blurb here. Yeah, I get that too. And, oh man, I don't know if I have it in me for a whole nother <laughs> sort of debate about ethics, but let's let's get into it best we can. So he's basically saying he doesn't know if 
this whole thing that he helped create is uh, he didn't stop to think about the ethics behind it before he did it. He just kind of did it. And, um, you know, I, I've seen there are uh, there are people who are getting into the ethics of social media and and sort of what the implications are for sharing something that then spreads to X amount of people and what the ethics behind um, these these sorts of design principles are. And I this is really interesting to me because you're right. It's like we don't he, or he's right. Rather, he, we don't have any sort of evidence as to what this is doing to young minds, um, you know, and it's it's humans are very much kind of act first, deal with the consequences later species. Right. Um, hey, this let's make this automobile that that gets us from point A to point B. All right. Let's make a million of them. And now we're dealing with, well, how do we clean up the atmosphere to um you know, help our climate. And so it's like, this is not the first time that we've done something stupid and have to clean up for it. But it's like, it's just another example of we should be more cognizant of maybe potentially creating something that could have implications and sort of start, uh, maybe start to think about what those implications could be prior to implementing them. I don't know. It's it's an interesting article for sure. And it's I'm most interested in his perspective that he almost regrets this entire thing. And that's, that's pretty crazy to me. Yeah, especially because, okay, a lot of the goal here was to get people engaged, keep them engaged, make a lot of money off of it. And the guy is a billionaire. And for him to be whether money is afforded the ability to take a look back and really understand like, Oh my goodness, what is this actually done or not? Like he's, he's coming out and saying in public, the thing that, that I, I guess I'm struggling with here is yes. Like that was, that was their goal trying to figure out like, how do people, how do we get people's time? How do we get as much of it as possible? And how do we keep them coming back for more? But I mean, Nick, we just got talking about done talking about that, same kind of situation in video game design like how do you keep people coming back for more and it's it's a strange question because you your analogy with the automobile is correct but oftentimes i think we find ourselves in a situation with technology where we just we have a need and we produce something really fast without ever understanding the consequences yeah and now as like technology is exponentially growing so is the research about it and we're starting to learn more about what to do about it, what to what we can do to combat some of the effects because is for for all the things that are going on with social media or um, new technology coming out and people using it so much the, the part that I do worry about is that, like his last thought and that's what's it doing to kids and we can we can go back and forth about the social media part being a problem right so is, is this right, just right. creating like an addict like getting their little dopamine dopamine drip every time they interact with something like Facebook or Twitter and then creating this entire social validation loop where you keep coming back for more and they're incentivizing you to create. But the, the other problem is, is we see technology being put into the classroom where most kids come home with tablets and they do, they do their homework. So technology is becoming so integrated in everybody's lives from now a very young age we're going to have to figure out the ethics in some kind of serious way, like how does algorithms work? What are they, what does AI do um, in certain situations that when it makes decisions, how do we make sure that we're not creating a bunch of screen addicts that we're actually like respecting people's time and we're not taking away from their productive lives. It's, it's so hard to even look at that. I don't, I don't even know where to start. Yeah. And I do have to point out the title of this article <clears throat> is, Former Facebook president admits it's exploiting a vulnerability in human psychology. And this is, yeah, it's, you have to exploit it to get what you want. But then, like, what are the ethics behind exploiting it? Do you, do you stop at a certain point because that would cross the line? You're already crossing the line by exploiting us. Like, what, where does it, it's such a blurry line. I would really love to sit down with an ethicist and kind of talk through these things. I know I saw one on um, a talk show a couple, a couple months ago. And, uh, you know, they were saying, what is the implication of um, some of these design choices, right? So, like, creating a red notification button or red notification instead of uh, another color. And that's, well, red is bad. I want to click on that. And that's another way to do it. And then trickling out, like, the likes. So that way you keep coming back for more. Is that ethical? 
the, it gets you coming back for sure and it monopolizes your time i don't know man it's there's so much stuff going on with this it's just so fascinating to me and also very dangerous i think yeah it's i don't know nick it's so hard to really figure out where i stand on this because I, at the other flip of the coin i think social media is amazing in the fact that you can look at like famous content creators like got the guys from Epic Mealtime. They were able to basically create their own show on a social media platform that led to them actually having a real show on television that's like led to successful careers that they might not have had without the medium. And they they use social media to its like highest extent to just create content, to have a good time, to get people engaged with them. And they do want people coming and spending the time clicking, liking, sharing the stuff. But it's 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 also enhance people's ability to be creative and do things they want to do in some regards. Sure. That's not everybody, of course. I think you're getting into a a different domain here, though, with content creators because content creation is different, right? You're creating something that you're having fun with, and if people like it, so what? That's that's icing on the cake. Um, This is designing a, a system intentionally to hack human psychology to where you are you are almost forced to use it um, just because of the design choices that went into it. Sure. I mean, this in itself creates a loop where it wants you, it forces you to want to create content for it because that gets you more interaction from other people around it. And I totally get that. But again, I'm always a big proponent of understand the rules of the game and game the system itself. But I, I do see what they've done and it is, (laughs) <laughs> it is a, a scary psychological trick for sure. All right, let's get into the last story because we're buttoned up against time here. But uh... All right. So I have a r- quick question. Was this meant to just be an exclusive? Um, Maybe. All right. Well, anyway. <laughs> so <laughs> we'll see. Blake may have made a mistake in the Slack. But anyhow, so we're talking a little bit more about virtual reality, one of our favorite topics on the show, especially this week. So virtual reality is arguably a good medium for actually enabling art, enabling people to create creative art that isn't actually possible with just physical objects alone and allows you to share pieces that it would be difficult to appreciate on just an ordinary computer screen. In light of this fact, HTC is actually launching a Vive Arts, a program that helps museums and other institutions fund, develop, and share art in VR. And yes, this means that you at ho- you can use apps like this at home at some point in the future, including one that's actually right around the corner. Nick, this is probably my favorite story that we've had in a couple of weeks because hey, I love too. the intersection of, again, VR, but creating more fun mediums for people to just have creative outlets. Yeah, this is a great note to end on. Um, I think so. This is there's a lot of art in VR that goes unnoticed, right? I I think about some of these um, developers that work on 3D content for games and and uh, you know, other simulation things, and that's art, really. I mean, it, it, if you really take a look at some of these environments that they're producing, something like Assassin's Creed Origins, they're actually using that representation of Egypt in schools now because they have a tourist mode where you can kind of go and walk around. It's funny that it's in a game called Assassin's Creed that they're putting into schools. But the idea is that they have, you know, tried to create this as historically accurate as they can, and you can actually go and tour Egypt as it would be uh, back in the day. And I think that is one example of a way that we have sort of... (laughs) Not necessarily. It, it, it's hard to appreciate 3D environments when you're not actually in them, right? If you could actually be in this environment and look around and go, wow, somebody created all of this. But even it goes more than that, right? Because you have tools that allow you to create sculptures and drawings in 3D and VR. And that's one thing. Uh, and then there's also the whole art behind uh, creating a virtual environment. And it's all just interesting to me. And I think this is a great great thing i cannot wait to jump into this museum and and see what kind of things people are coming up with most definitely i mean it's such an epic application i feel like it's only gonna make the scope of what vr can do just that much wider and to be honest this is this was one of the things even though the article kind of makes a contradictory statement about people about this but this is kind of one of the things that would make me want to get a vr headset because i would love to just get get in there and use an app to create something i wanted to whether it's a piece of art or an actual virtual environment awesome story nick yes all right well i think that's it for today 
uh, let's go ahead and get out of here because I want to go play some Battlefront. Uh, so if, <laughs> if you guys let us know what you guys think of the stories this week. Did you like them? Hate them? Let us know. If you have any suggestions for topics or news stories that you want us to cover, you can follow us all over social media. Like I said, we do post exclusives in the Slack, so come join us there. Uh, head on over to the Human Factors Cast LinkedIn, Facebook, or Twitter at H Factors Podcast. You can always check out our SoundCloud, leave us a comment over there, or send us an email at humanfactorscast at gmail.com. If you like what we're doing, uh, you can support us on our Patreon at patreon.com slash humanfactorscast. Be sure to like, subscribe, review us on Apple Podcasts, the Google Play Store, 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 